Yomo is here with us today. Um, and Yomo will be uh, talking about uh, various editors, validators, and parsers, and other tools for both general and more specific purposes. Yomo has been a contributor to OSM for a few years and has uh, collected a lot of experience and like some specific tips and tricks learned during that time. Um, and off to the shark with the Ethernet cable. Yomo. Yes, thanks for the introduction and welcome to my talk titled How to become an OpenStreetMap Pro. Uh, maybe let's start with what not to expect. So I won't be giving uh, a general OSM introduction. I also won't go over basic tagging or basic editor usage. And also please don't expect to be an OpenStreetMap Pro after just watching this. Um, but what you can expect is some tips and some tricks that I've learned over all the years. I will share some tools. I will maybe show a f very few examples that can help you in becoming an OpenStreetMap Pro. Um, also, I have many slides and I have only 30 minutes of time, so I will mention a lot of tools and I can't walk you through all of them in this presentation. Uh, you will have to look them up and try for yourself what you like and what works for you. Uh, but I will upload the slides after the talk and they will contain uh, a bunch of links that you can click on and you can find my contact info at the end of the presentation. Uh, so, the first thing I want to point out is that OpenStreetMap is, despite its name, not an actual map. Uh, but when people visit the OpenStreetMap website, then it it looks very similar to, for example, Google Maps, and so people just uh, people keep comparing it the, the OpenStreetMap website to Google Maps, and then they basically think that OpenStreetMap is what the OpenStreetMap website looks like. Uh, but that's not really a fair comparison because the OpenStreetMap website is just a demo of what you could do with the data. And that's what OpenStreetMap is actually. It's it's just a database. It's a data project. And that's what people often mistake. And so that's why I'm pointing it out. Um, so let's start right into, into editing. Um, you're probably familiar with this. This is the ID editor. Um, might be a no-brainer, but I really recommend checking out all the keyboard shortcuts you can uh, find in, in the ID editor and also go through all the menus you find in ID and discover all the features. Uh, I really recommend um, spending that time and uh, discovering w what you can enable and, and what might be helpful because there really are a lot of tools integrated into ID already and if you remember the keyboard shortcuts or at least know that certain features exist um, then this will help a lot when editing. The next thing that's helpful when editing is um, being aware that the fields that ID um, that ID shows you when you're editing a feature can be a bit misleading because ID has a lot of uh, preset fields for many features but these fields don't support all the possible values that could be in there and if ID doesn't support it then it might just not display it. Um, and also there could be variations of keys that ID is not aware of. Uh, so attributes may appear missing, although they are actually in the in the actual tags, which you can find further down if you scroll down a bit on, in, on the left side in ID. You can see it on the right here on my screen. Um, but uh, yeah, the tags are really the, the truth. They are what actually ends up in the database. And you should um, you can use the fields if you like them, but you should always double check with the tags. And if you're not familiar with the tag, click on the info button on the right, and you might get some info. If you don't find info about it, try looking it up in the OpenStreetMap wiki. That's always a good thing to do. Just always search the wiki. <laughs> what you can also do if you want to find out about tags is uh, tag info which is uh, a website that has statistics on popularity of OpenStreetMap tags. It has all the values that are used somewhere in the world for a specific key. And you can also find combinations uh, where this tag is, for example, very often used with another tag. And you can also use overpass and try to find features there and uh, use them as an example. And what you can also do is for some specific tags like opening hours or traffic signs, there are specific tools. Um, they are not built into ID, but um, they, you can find them. And they help because um, they 
basically they they uh, help you in these somewhat more complicated values. For example, you can just click on the traffic signs that you're seeing in the real world, and this will um, will just uh, be the value that you need to enter. Similar for the opening hours. Um, then. In ID, if you've ever tried to split a building or any other type of area, you might notice that it basically it results in a big mess because ID just creates multi-polygons uh, where you end up with... It, it actually splits the building, but then it it uh, removes all the tags from the value uh, from from the buildings and creates a new relation and it's a bit messy. And if you don't want that, you can trick ID a little bit, uh, a li <laughs> sorry, a little bit, by uh, just changing the tag that causes ID to render it as an as an area. So, for example, the the building tag you just add an underscore, something like that, as you can see here, and then ID will actually render this as a line, and you can then split the line, and then you get two ways. Uh, you can close these ways. And change the tag back to an actual building, and that's how you how you end up with uh, a properly separated uh, separate building. Um, then, what also what's sometimes annoying in ID is when you have an intersection and you want to you want to split only one way that's crossing this intersection. Um, when you select the node and press X. To split it, it will it will split all the ways connected to it. And if you don't want that, you can actually select multiple features in ID just using the Shift key. You can select the way and the node, and then press X to split it. And then it will only split the way that uh, you want to split. Um, it works very similar when you have multiple ways sharing an intersection node, and you want to disconnect one ray from the intersection. Um, then you basically end up with two nodes at the same position and the problem is ID will only allow you to select the top node when you click on it but you can then use the lasso select mode and this will basically select both the nodes at the same position and on the left side you can then just click on uh, either node that you want to move away but now maybe let's talk about JOSM uh, I guess you've heard about it it's pretty much the most advanced editor available and it can be very overwhelming at first when you when you open it and i wouldn't recommend it to to use josm when you just start using openstreetmap or or making your first edits but um if you've been uh, doing some uh, openstreetmap contributions then uh, josm was going to be very helpful especially if you have, uh, if you enable styles and plugins and I go over that a little bit. So this is how JOSM looks like by default. Uh, this is the, the default um, rendering for uh, the OpenStreetMap data, the default style. Uh, but there's also, just as an example, this style that renders uh, road lanes, including turn lanes. Uh, and here's a style that renders sidling infrastructure. And if I go back and forth, you can see it's the same intersection, it's the exact same area, just displayed using different styles. And this can be especially helpful when you want to focus on uh, one, sti one specific thing that you want to edit. Then there's also other editors. For example, this one is called Rapid, and it's based on ID, but it has some, uh, it has some data sets included that uh, have features that were detected on aerial imagery. Um, for example, this one is somewhere in Africa where uh, a lot of buildings are missing, but Microsoft has a research project where they try to detect buildings from satellite images, and they made this data set available, and now with this editor, you can just zoom in somewhere where you want to add data, and it gives you these su suggestions in pink. And you just click on them, and then you can use them, and you can upload it. Um, but this is also available in JOSM. Uh, in general, a lot of the things I'm going to cover here are available in JOSM either directly or via plugin or style or something. Uh, then there's OSM InEdit, <coughs> sorry, which is an editor for indoor mapping. And you can upload floor plans there as a, as a background image, which is very helpful if you're doing indoor mapping. 
Um, for example, you can upload uh, fire and rescue maps. Those are often they are quite accurate. Just make sure that you have the usage rights to actually use them. But if you are allowed to use them, those are very helpful. Um, but once again, this is also available as a JOSM style. Uh, then there's another editor called Level Zero Editor, and this is uh, available as a website. And it's as you can see, just it's a simple text editor. Um, and usually, you probably wouldn't want to uh, want to edit like this. You probably want to have a graphical interface where you can see what you're moving around. But for some tasks, uh, this is a lot easier to do in text. Uh, for example, you can just copy the text out and use your favorite text editing tool. For example, do some search and replace on really a lot of features and then paste it back in. Uh, or you can adjust the position to some exact position. If you know the exact coordinates of a feature, then you can edit it very simply here and you don't have to move your cursor around to the right position. Um, then, if you're editing, um, street-level images might be very helpful. And some of these are available also in ID or JOSM. For example, Bing Street Site or Mapillary, which is very similar to Google Street View, but it's often more up-to-date. And sometimes it even has a lot more coverage where a street is covered multiple times in different directions or in different times of a year. And in, in some countries, it's really a lot better than Google Street View, actually. And uh, there's also Carter View, which used to be open, uh, called OpenStreetCam. It's very similar. And then there's Wikimedia Commons, which is where all the photos for Wikipedia are basically uploaded. And what's most important is you can upload there, on, except for Bing Street Site, I think. Um, but you can upload to these services. And if you go out mapping and take some photos, um, please do it because it's extremely helpful when you're editing somewhere and some other mappers have already uploaded photos there. But yeah, of course, there are also other data sources. Um, I'm, I guess you've all seen uh, the, the aerial imagery that's available by default in ID and in JOSM. But there's also official government open data. And in recent years, governments have actually realized that Open data is sort of nice to have in some cases. And sometimes they just publish it without really announcing it. So it makes sense to check often um, because maybe your government, your local government has published some data that you haven't been aware of. Um, I also know that not all of this data is available by default in ID or JOSM. So you have to actually search for it. Um, and then Note that even if it is available as a map, as a background map in ID or JOSM, note that some of these, sometimes this, these um, open data resources have more data than just the images. For example, they might have uh, a building, a building map, and you can render this as a as an image map, but you can also use this as a map where. Uh, where you can get more information about the features in there. So the government might have data about the height of the buildings or the number of levels or the type of building, or they might even have a map of trees and store what kind of tree it is. But you won't see that visually on the map. You might need some extra tools to look into this data uh, if you want to import it. Again, keep in mind, it needs to be open data and it needs to be compatible with the open uh, open street license um, but yeah just check if, if maybe you can use that also note that sometimes uh, in in some governments uh, in some in some jurisdictions uh, when the government makes an official announcement then um, sometimes this is by default open data that you can just use and so it, it, this might not be published as open data, but it might still be open data. Um, then you can uh, try searching for other maps, like mapwapa.net. They have people can upload maps there, and they might be new, they might be old, but maybe you can find something there. 
And then there's drone footage where people basically uh, fly over some region and take pictures and make them available for free and you can use them. And then of course there's GPS tracks and you can upload and download GPS tracks on the OpenStreetMap website. It's a built-in feature. And this is especially useful when when you want to add ways or paths uh, where there's no good aerial imagery available. For example, in the forest where you just can't see it, you can use GPS tracks uh, that people have uploaded and then you can see um, where it goes. What Sometimes it's also helpful to see if you're not sure if there's a barrier somewhere and you can see that GPS tracks are going through it, then you can be fairly sure that there's probably not a barrier, or at least not not a barrier that blocks you from going through. And then there's sometimes also DTM, which is Digital Terrain Model. And I'm going to show you where this is useful. Um, this is aerial imagery of a forest and you can't really see a lot except for trees. And this is the same location shown as DTM. And now you can actually see a road very well. You might maybe kind of make it out here, but you can't really see it very well. But here you can see it very, very well. And you can also see that there's uh, small footpaths in the forest. And this is where DTM is very helpful and allows you to, uh, yeah, to, uh, to map there. Then we have normal aerial imagery. And sometimes it can be very hard to, dis to distinguish um, if the image is low resolution or if it's dark or if it's just blurry. And you might not really see a difference between forests and water bodies or buildings and shadows and so on. But sometimes this um, aerial imagery is also available with invisible wavelengths, such as infrared, for example. And these can be colored with false color. And this one, again, it's the exact same location. Uh, but this one highlights agriculture and vegetation. And you can distinguish some features very well here. Uh, here's another example, again, the same location, but uh, these false colors make it easier to see water. So sometimes uh, you can find this and then you can use it. But now maybe let's talk about how making changes to OpenStreetMap actually works. So when you're making a change and you want to upload it, what your editor does for you is it actually opens a change set receives the change set ID and then uploads the actual changes which can be multiple steps. You can repeat this as, as often as you want and then the change set is closed. And it's it's not super important to understand but um, sometimes it helps that the, the change set itself doesn't really have any changes itself. Only the OSM changes have changes that are related to the change set. And also note that ID always does everything at once, which is my why maybe you haven't noticed this. Uh, it just creates a change set, uploads a single change, and then closes it within one second, basically. Uh, this is how change sets look like. On the right side, you can see how they look on the website. On the left side, you can see how they actually look. I won't go into the details. If you can read XML, you can read it. But uh, it's just... You can see that they basically only have the area of where the change set happened, but no actual changes. Um, this is how the changes look like. Again, not going into the XML. Uh, what's more important is that you can export this format from editors. For example, you can make changes in ID, and then you can export them and import them into Level 0 or JOSM to make further edits that might be better suited in, in the other editor. Now, once you've actually uploaded your data. Um, we need some quality assurance, or short QA, which is basically about validating your own changes or mapping other people's changes. It's also about finding missing data or detecting issues such as invalid tags or uh, missing tags or other common mistakes. And there really are a lot of tools. Uh, I'm going to show some. Some are more general purpose, some are more tailored tools. Uh, what you can also do is you can request review. This is especially recommended 
if you're not so familiar with OpenStreetMap, if you're not, or if you're just not entirely sure if something you've edited is 100% correct, then in ID and in JOSM you can basically uh, tick this checkbox before you upload it. And it won't do a whole lot, it will just add this review requested uh, tag to, cha to the change set. And other mappers, or you if you want to review it, will need some tools uh, to, to find these changes, uh, to find these, sorry, to find these change sets that have been tagged with review requested. And to observe, cha uh, to observe changes in, let's say, your hometown or wherever you want, your, your local area, um, there are some uh, QA RSS feeds. And some are basically to discover new nodes, and we will talk about that in a bit. You can also find new contributors, or you can find these change sets with uh, review requests. You can also, if you want, you can also find all the change sets in your area and get notified it, get get notified about them with these uh, feeds. And there, there are also feeds for new detected QA warnings for some of the tools that I'm going to change uh, to show you. Um, and then there's OSM char, which is a website-based tool that is made for reviewing uh, in particular and covers some of these things. Now, when you want to review changes, which basically means looking at a change set, what you can do is you can, on the website, on the OpenStreetMap website, just look at the element history. Um, this this might sometimes be enough to, to do a simple review, but there are better tools, uh, such as tools that will show you the tag history of an element in a, in a more pleasant way. Uh, there are tools that visualize the geometry difference that has been introduced by a change set. And there are also analyzers for relations and, and their changes. But to actually understand this, uh, maybe we should look a bit at how nodes and ways actually look like in the database and this is not exactly how it looks like but it's it's close enough and uh, you can see we have nodes and we have ways and we have like a, a join table and they all have a version number and this version number increases whenever an element changes and as you can also see only nodes have an actual location uh, given by their latitude and longitude and ways don't have a location themselves. They just have a list of nodes which is stored in the way nodes uh, and the way nodes have a sequence ID which determines the order of nodes within a way. And now it's important that when you change the location of a node that will increase the version number of the node and, w and it will move the node to wherever you've moved it. And if it is connected to a way, or part of a way maybe, then the way will change visually. But because the way itself has not really been modified, only the node has been modified, the version number of the way will not increase. And that's something to keep in mind that a way can change without the version uh, the version number increasing. And then with what we can also see here is the visible attribute, uh, which is always true except when you're deleting a feature. In that case, it's set to false, but you can always undo this, so nothing is ever actually deleted, it's just set to invisible. And maybe let's just look at a random rectangular building like this one, which has four nodes, of course, it's, it's rectangle, but as you can see on the left side, it has five nodes. And the last node equals the first node. And that's how in OpenStreetMap closed ways are determined. Because otherwise it might just be U-shaped. And to look at changes, there's, uh, for example, there's Archavi, uh, which is the augmented OSM change viewer, which allows you to see the geometry difference that has been introduced uh, by a change. You can also hover over over parts of the geometry and this will 
um, basically show you the tags that have been changed. And there are some very similar tools that are, have like one or more uh, feature in addition or less. And then there's the OSM history viewer, which highlights the change tags that have been changed in, in one uh, change set. It also has a visual map like the one we've just seen, but uh, it makes it very easy to see which tags have been changed and which ones have not been changed or which tags have been introduced. Then there's the OSM deep history, where you can see the entire history, not just the history of, of a single change set. And that's very useful when you're wondering, uh, for example, when was some tag added the first time and you don't want to go through all the changes, uh, all the versions that have uh, been made over a feature. And this allows you just to basically scroll sideways and see when, when something has been introduced the first time. And um, Then there's the OSM history browser. This one supports nodes, ways and relations. And it's especially useful for ways and relations because it shows you um, all the nodes that are part of a way and it shows you all the members that are part of a relation and it will show you the order of them and it will also for uh, for a way uh, for sorry for a relation it will tell you the type of membership and you can see when that changes and you can also see when the order changes um, things like that uh, and this is especially for for relations it's very useful then there's ptna which is the public transport network analysis this detects errors in public transport network relations and I recommend you just look at it. Uh, the FAQ lists many more Q and a, QA tools. Um, then we have map nodes, which maybe you're already familiar, familiar with. They can be created by anyone just on the OpenStreetMap website and you can you don't even need to be logged in. You can upload these anonymously. And you just click somewhere on the map and then you have a text field and you can report issues. And these are basically used to report missing data or wrong data. And sometimes they are then also used to discuss how to add or how to fix data. Um, on the OpenStreetMap website, you can just enable this on the right side as an, as an overlay. They are also available in ID and JOSM, but uh, be aware that this will only show you the currently open nodes and nodes that have recently been closed. But the the older nodes are not gone; they are just not displayed, and that's where this tool called Nodes Review uh, can be very helpful because it allows to allows you to search for uh, very old nodes or just nodes that have been have disappeared. From the from the default uh, notes layer, and sometimes this this can be very useful if you want to look up uh, why something was uh, changed that way, or if you if you've been doing this for a few years, you might remember that uh, something was discussed in a note and you can't find it anymore. With notes review, you can probably find it again. Um, then there's this tool called Who Did It, which allows you to see areas of recent changes and also allows you to uh, to go to an area and then see changes that have been made there. And it will also include short statistics about uh, the single change sets, as you can see here in uh, green, yellow and red, and shows you uh, how many nodes, ways and relations have been created, modified or deleted. There's also OSM OSE or OSMOSE, which detects common mistakes such as tag combinations that don't make sense or maybe suspicious geometries. And this has a lot of false positives, but you can basically just tell it that it's a false positive and then it won't appear again. There's also keep right, which is basically the same but different. There's also OSM inspector, which is the same but different. Then there's nominatum QA which is similar but different. And this one focuses more on the issues for nominatum search, which, by the way, nominatum is the 
default search engine that's used on the OpenStreetMap website. When you enter something there that you want to search, um, that's where Nominatim comes in. There's also B-Router Suspects, which is again similar but different. Uh, this one focuses mostly on routing and connectivity issues in the data. And right here it's shown in a tool called Osmoscope. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> right here it's shown in Osmoscope uh, and Osmoscope allows loading uh, many sources of uh, basically uh, QA tools and B-Router is just one of them. There's also Improve OSM, which is available in ID and in JOSM. And they use big data to do some analysis. And uh, for example, they can they have thousands of recorded trips. And sometimes they can see that on an intersection like the one shown here, uh, there's very few people that make a left turn. And then they basically conclude that maybe it's not allowed to do a left turn there if barely anyone does it. And I find this a very clever use of this data and they make it available to OpenStreetMap and then you can just um, basically look at it and determine if, if it's a false positive or if there's actually a turn restriction that's missing. Then there's MapRoulette, which is a bit different because it's not really a QA tool in itself, but anyone can create challenges there for other mappers. And sometimes these challenges are basically issues that some some mapper has found and wants, uh, wants other mappers to review if they're actually indeed issues or not. But it can also be used to, for example, import data and have some human review in it and it's very great if you're bored and don't know what to map. Just go to MapRoulette and pick one of the challenges and you can just click through it and start mapping. Very similar is then Peak Review. Also not a QA tool, but very similar to also Street Complete, for example. But you don't have to uh, leave your chair. And they also do some very clever thing. They have features that have missing details. And they basically they noticed that there's mapillary imagery very close to it, and you might be able to see the feature on it. Uh, for example, in this case, they have um, some sort of bike parking, and they don't know what type. But there's mapillary imagery available, and then it basically shows you this feature and asks you to confirm or not to confirm, just asks you what kind of parking, uh, bicycle parking it is and you can then add this data and don't need to leave leave your house. Um, then we have change set discussions. As you may know on the OpenStreetMap website on the OpenStreetMap website uh, when you open a change set you can you can add comments there. And once you add a comment the uploader of the change set will receive an email and you can use this to ask questions about these changes or inform them about mistakes uh, or discuss if maybe uh, the changes could be improved or something like that. Just please keep it friendly and again there are tools like uh, this tool called How Did You Contribute which allows you to track unearned, unanswered discussions, either where you've asked a question and the original uploader did not reply, or where they have replied but you haven't replied back again to them. Uh, these tools can help. And then last but not least, uh, there's reverts, which is basically a rollback of a change set. And this will, this will undo all the changes that have been introduced in a change set and then uh, basically the map data will be exactly as it was before except for the version number which increases and this can also undo deletions as, as I've uh, told you before and sometimes this may be necessary because there was vandalism or it was just plain wrong um, and maybe it's easier to just undo it all and then 
uh, start over again. And you can do this by hand using your favorite editor. Um, <coughs> sorry again. You can do this by hand using your favorite editor. Um, if it's just a simple revert, like um, undoing a, a single tag change, this might be okay and might be the fastest way. But if it's a bit of a bigger change that you want to undo, there's a JOSM plugin and there's also um, the revert UI, which is a web-based tool. And yeah, what's more, the wiki knows everything except when it doesn't. Um, but really, the OpenStreetMap wiki has a lot of information and I recommend you to uh, to search the wiki for everything you can come up with. And when you use the search, you can actually change the search results to search everything and not just content pages. And that's very important because when you do search the wiki, by default it will only search the yeah these content pages as they are called. But a lot of the actual content is also in discussion pages or in user pages and the default search will not find that. Um, then we have user diaries where every user can uh, can yeah make sort of blog posts and you can uh, subscribe to them and you can also subscribe to only the one in, in your lang language and that's how a lot of discussions in OpenStreetMap happen and how a lot of the tools are announced and discussed and uh, there are some great insights there. And then there's this uh, website called Weekly OSM, which is a blog that appears once every week in a dozen languages. And they basically summarize the, p the past week of what has happened in the OpenStreetMap ecosystem. And they announce any major occurrences and important discussions, important decisions, and new tools and all, all sorts of things. And there's also B Router, which you can use to create custom routing profiles or just to test how routing works. And you can import this into Osmond. And then there's a bunch of uh, tools collections. Again, you can also find all of them on the wiki, for example, on the QA page. But there's also the OSM Smart Menu, which is a browser extension uh, that covers many of the tools that I've shown you in this presentation and makes it very easy to uh, to switch between them. Then there's the State of the Map, which is a conference that uh, is pretty much only about OpenStreetMap. And there's um, it happens every year and there's a lot of talks that are recorded. You can find them online, uh, but you can also maybe visit it next time if you want. And then, of course, there's uh, a few mailing lists if you're into that, but there's also matrix chats and RC and Telegram groups. And maybe you've noticed this when you make a change uh, in the ID editor and you upload it, then it will actually tell you where you can find these local um, Telegram or matrix groups or maybe even local uh, mapping groups and how to connect with them. And that's definitely worth checking out. And yeah, sometimes people do local meetups and you should visit them if you want to. Um, and if there are none, maybe just start one. Just ask your neighborhood mappers and start a meetup. And that's about it for my presentation. Thanks a lot for listening and I'll be around for questions. So, thank you very much, Yomo. That was an amazing talk. We've got a few questions we got in our various social channels. If you still want to ask questions, go ahead. Either ask them in directly in the Twitch or in the YouTube chats. Uh, you may also ask them on social media using the Firesongs hashtag. Uh, or you can ask them in our IRC channel on HackIn, um, in the channel Firesongs22. Um, I've got a few questions for you. Uh, first of all, um, 
when on holidays I want to fix stuff, I very often end up conflicted. Uh, do I do it the way described in the wiki? Do I do it like the JOSN templates uh, are doing it? Uh, or do I do it similarly to what's already done in the neighborhood? Uh, for example, cycleways, uh, do I do them as a relation, uh, as an attribute to the main motorway, or a separate way in parallel? Um, I assume there is no right way, but is there? Is it like possible to start editing without consulting with locals first, which on holiday isn't always possible? Um, yeah, that's an maybe an issue. Maybe it's uh, just a, a design feature of OpenStreetMap, but there is no correct way, and the yeah, what people find the the best solution changes, and sometimes it changes over time, and sometimes it changes on depending on where you map. But to answer the actual question, no, there is there's no single solution to it. Um, what you can do though is you can, if you don't have someone to ask, you can look at the data at how it has been mapped in the past uh, by local mappers around there, and that maybe maybe that helps. Um, we've got another question in the same way. Uh, it's asking, like, kind of a style guide. I'll ask it anyways. Um, do I or don't I map short time changes? For example, a road is under construction and therefore out of service. At like what time threshold do I map or don't map the changes? Two weeks? A month? Um, in some areas, OSM is quite fast at adopting that kind of change. In other areas, it isn't. Um, what about offline maps, which are based on this data? Um, and will carry temporary obstructions for months, maybe years. Is the solution to mark changes as short-term? Um, I think maybe the wiki has information about what would, would be rule of thumb of uh, what what uh, what's a good or what's long enough for to to justify adding it to OpenStreetMap. But what you can do is. Um, there are temporary restrictions that are basically based on the opening hours format, sort of. So you can basically say that a road is uh, open for traffic except during a certain time where it is closed. And you can then add that and that way you can basically say it's going to be closed for one month, for example. Um, yeah, maybe that helps. Maybe that helps. Um, another slightly different question. Why contribute to OSM? What got you started personally? Like, what, what were the reasons behind looking at OSM and starting to contribute? You've been a long-time contributor. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think what got me into OpenStreetMap was that I've been using it uh, with, I think it was with, with Osmand uh, to get somewhere. And it took me to the wrong side of the building. And then I was like, okay, I can fix this. And then I fixed it. Um, that's how I got into OpenStreetMap. But to, to answer the other question, why contribute to OpenStreetMap? Uh, because I think it's the, the best uh, geodata base that we have. And it helps a lot of people to build really amazing stuff. There's a lot of very, very useful applications that use OpenStreetMap in the background without people really knowing it. But uh, there are a lot of tools and a lot of them really do help. And that's why I think it's it's worth to contribute. Um, I don't see any other questions in the pad right now. I'm going to give it a second. And while I do that, I want to pass on a huge thanks and appreciation for your talk from social media, in this case, especially Twitter. Um, someone really seemed to enjoy your talk. Thank you for that. Nice. Um, Thank you as well. And maybe move to Mastodon when you're on Twitter. <laughs> uh, I think that's it. I don't see any other questions. I'm going to refresh the page one more time just to make sure that I'm not missing anything. Uh, no, that appears to be it. Um, Thank you again. Thanks so much for your talk. It was quite amazing. Uh, put your hands together for our speaker, Yomo. Thanks for having me.